Now to make our corn wine, we're going to need the following. Normally I would transition one of each of these ingredients in as I, as I point them out, but because there's a lot going on, we'll just simply point them out while they're all on the counter. We are going to need the following. 14 ears of fresh corn, sweet corn if you can get it. We're going to need about two pounds of sugar. We'll work out how many cups that is later on. We need half a cup of orange juice. We're going to be using a Red Star Premier Coute des Blanc wine yeast because of its low AVB characteristics and it should leave some residual sweetness if we're lucky. We're going to need a packet of original active dry bread yeast. And we're going to be using that to make a yeast nutrient for our wine yeast to give them a good start early on in the process. We're going to need one black tea bag, which is going to provide some tannin to our wine or a little bit of astringency in the back end. We're going to need about a handful of raisins. Again, handful, doesn't matter, just some raisins. Uh, we are going to need, on the other side, a gallon of clean filtered water. It would be helpful if we had a wide mouth fermenter so that we can actually put in some of our corn cobs later on for a bit. Again, this particular fermenter does have a built-in airlock. Then later on, we are going to transfer this into our secondary carboy jug, demijohn, whatever. And of course, you're going to need an airlock and bung with that. We're going to need a large pot that's going to be large enough to hold our 14 ears of corn. It would be helpful if you had a hydrometer so that we can determine our alcohol content at the end of the process and to help us to determine if there's going to be any problems with the fermentation. And of course, as I always like to say, last but certainly not least, a food grade sanitizer, one step, star sand, whatever you use, as long as it's appropriate, that is what we are going to be using to make this wine. Now, the first thing we need to do is that we need to remove all of the silk from our, from our corn. I'm sure there are many ways of doing it. Whatever method works for you best, that's the method you should use. But the, the trick is to try and remove just as many of, many of these fine hairs of silk as possible. I'm not going to go through the laborious process of showing you how I do it on film, but let's just be honest, this will get done for this and all the rest of these. All right, and so far as I'm concerned, good enough. Now then, let's get these into a pot. And onto the stove. Now, while we're around our stove area, we might as well go ahead and give our raisins a nice, good, rough chop. Now, again, it's just a small handful of raisins. There's no precise number. There's no precise weight. But if you want to count them all, I'll give you a quick second to count them all now. Now then, for the rest of the world, who's got better things to do with our time, let's go ahead and give these try it with my other hand. A good rough chop. Raisins are to give a little bit of added flavor and a little bit of extra body to our wine. And we'll just get those ready because we're going to add those to our pot shortly. Now in a small pot, we're going to have a couple of things going on at the same time. We're going to pour in a little bit of our water 
well, I don't know, half a cupish ought to do it. Doesn't really matter because most of the water is already going to go into the pot. We want to drop in our tannin substitute and we want to go ahead and while we're at it, add in a quarter of a teaspoon of yeast. And this is our bread yeast and that's going to act as our yeast nutrient for our wine yeast to chow down on. But we can't do that while the yeast is still alive so when we bring this up to a simmer that's going to kill off the bread yeast and that will act as food for the wine yeast. Let's go ahead and drop in our chopped up raisins. We can do this really at any time, quite honestly, but now's a good time. And let's bring the heat on up to a simmer. And what we really want is a nice strong <laughs> thing of tea. Now in our big pot, we want to go ahead and add in the rest of our water. And we want to go ahead and turn the heat up on high for this one. Now since I no longer have the lid for this pot, that will work just as well. All right, now that our water has come to a boil, let's go ahead and let these cook for 15 minutes. Okay, it's been 15 minutes. Let's go ahead and turn off the heat. And let's go ahead and remove our corn. All right, with our corn removed, we are going to do a couple of things. One, we are going to add in are three and a half cups of sugar. If you're wondering where two pounds of sugar comes close to, three and a half cups. And we're going to go ahead and give that a good stir. Let's go ahead and incorporate that. Doesn't take long to dissolve. While we're at it, we can go ahead and add in our after removing our tea bag, don't need that anymore. Go ahead and add in our raisin slash tannin substitute slash yeast nutrient. Add that to the mix. We then want to go ahead and return to the pot four of our corn cobs. We then also want to move the light here a little bit because I'm going to need another plate. We then want to go ahead and cover our must. And we want to let this come down to room temperature. Now the next thing we want to do is we want to go ahead and see if we can juice our half a cup of orange juice. Looks like some pretty juicy oranges. Let's see how lucky I get with just one. All right, juice of one juicy orange. Use a little strainer here, keep seeds from going inside. Get out of there. Well, not quite. Looks like it's going to come in at just over a quarter of a cup. 
Well, that being the case, five. That's why we got two oranges. All right, let's go ahead and add that to the mix. Which already is half a cup. A little extra won't, won't hurt. Now, if anyone is thinking about, well, can I just use already squeezed orange juice from a, from, from a container? Well, yeah, <laughs> make sure to, your wine, you make it your way. Now then, let's uh, take our lid off our corn. Let's go ahead and remove those four corn cobs that we put in the day before. They're no longer needed. Using my freshly sanitized pair of tongs here. Get those out of there. And let's go ahead and incorporate our orange juice. Again, giving it a nice little stir with our freshly sanitized utensil here. Because the next thing I want to do is take a hydrometer reading. And it looks like our hydrometer reading is coming in at 1.082. Now, taking the liberty of transferring our musk from the pot to our primary fermenter, and because we're not putting any fruit down or vegetables down into the uh, primary fermentation vessel, you really don't need a wide mouth fermenter to do that. You could have just used a standard one gallon jug, demijohn, carboy, and you would have done exactly the same thing. Only remember that this one does have a built in airlock, this one you're using a standard airlock. Now, to begin the process of turning our juice into wine, we need, of course, to add our yeast. Again, if you don't have wine yeast, use what you got. Now, in this case, we're only, we are only going to be using a quarter of a teaspoon of wine yeast, which is all I generally use in all my batches because a quarter of a teaspoon is enough. You just want to just kind of like sprinkle it around more or less evenly across the top. If you want to bloom your yeast, feel free. If you want to stir it up, feel free. But generally, that's all I need to do. Now, we should always label our creation. We are making a corn wine. We started it on this date, and our original gravity reading was 1.082. We need that so we can compare it to our ending gravity reading so we know how much alcohol we produced. Okay, so, well, what happens next? Well, for the next three days, if you are using a wide mouth fermenter, you just go ahead and give it a nice vigorous stir once a day, just for the first three days. After that, leave it alone. Now then, after, well, after, oh, I don't know, say six or seven weeks, you can then go ahead and begin the process of racking, which is transferring it from one fermenter to a second fermenter, leaving behind as much lease or dead yeast behind as possible. Over the next several months, it will begin to get clearer and clearer. Normally, I like to wait at least 12 months before giving my wine a tasting. If you want to try it sooner than that, please feel free. It's entirely up to you because it's your wine. After that, I'll, I'll bottle it, or rather degas it, Back sweetening, which means adding more sugar at the very end to my liking. Then uh, uh, degassing again, pasteurizing, bottling, and labeling, and then enjoying my wine. And that's the process that I use. Uh, you can find all of those processes, of course, in my playlist under winemaking operations. And most of the equipment that I'm using in this video, you can find Amazon links to those in either the description section or the comment section of the video as well. And then again, at the end of 12 months, there'll be a tasting and a separate video on that as well. So there we go. That's my take on making corn wine. See you in 12 months. All right, 12 months has passed and it's now time to taste what we've created here. Uh, a few particulars, one, 
for Y, of course. Born 7 8 2022. Uh, ABB came in at 12.08%, and it's been pasteurized. <laughs> uh, I mean, it went fairly clear. Uh, looks like I bottled this some time ago. Oh, speaking of which, uh, in the intervening time between the end and the last portion of the video and this portion of the video, this wine has been wrapped several times. It's been, it's been degassed. It's been back sweetened. It's been, of course, bottled, corked, labeled, and pasteurized. Not in that order, but nonetheless, that's what's happened uh, in the intervening time and there are standalone videos for each and every one of those you can find in my uh, wine making operations playlist. Now then, uh, again, it did not go totally clear. I mean, there is a slight, very light layer of sediment down at the bottom. Uh, yeah. But uh, that having been said, let's get right into this one. Been so long since I back sweetened this one, I have no idea what it tastes like. I really don't know what it tastes like when I'm doing the back sweetening because I'm using so little of it to do the back sweetening. All right. Hey. Hey, Rick. You really can't smell corn, that's for sure. You can, unless your brain starts playing little tricks on you, you kind of want to think that you can smell corn, but other than that, nope, you're just smelling alcohol. That's all you're smelling. But let's see what it tastes like. Eh. You got to try real hard to try and imagine that you're tasting corn because <laughs> you're really not. Uh, it's kind of on the sweet side, which is how I like my uh, wines to be back sweetened. How you prefer your wines to be back sweetened, if at all. It's entirely up to you because during fermentation, the wine will go dry completely. So if that's how you like your wine, then you're, 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 you're okay, but I don't. Um, I mean, the taste, the overall flavor is very light. Um, I'm almost inclined to say I'm getting more uh, flavor from the uh, uh, sugar that I use to bring it back. So we think it was just simple, plain table sugar is what I use. Um, it's kind of pleasant. Definitely chilled. It should be chilled. I don't really know these things until you can do the actual tasting on uh, before you try to decide what can make it better. Um, I don't know, chilled. But apart from that, it's got a very light flavor. Kind of hard to describe. I mean, it's definitely drinkable. Well, um, at least it goes to say that you can make wine from corn, amongst other things, which unfortunately in this country is illegal. <laughs> it tends to steal it, but apart from that, uh, no, it's it's not bad. Um, <clears throat> it's not bad. Before I take this next sip, I keep saying it's not bad, but apparently it's good enough to where you want to take another sip of it. Yeah, chill this down a little bit. And listen, okay, I've got four more bottles of this remaining from the one gallon batch. Um, yeah, um, 
at the one year mark, this is not bad at all. I mean, it's not outstanding, it's not phenomenal or anything like that, but definitely it is drinkable. Just a bit light on flavor, but apart from that, it's drinkable. But again, again at 12.08%, you might want to be careful because you might find yourself consuming quite a bit of this, not realizing that you're also consuming a fair amount of alcohol. So drink in moderation. So before my uh, my my wall grandfather clock goes off, I just want to say, if you like what you see here, please click on that subscribe and notify button. Uh, become a member from Patreon, help support the channel out. And I will see you in the next video.